and um, thank you for joining us on this, um, this special uh, recording that we're doing. We just want to be able to share with you as you're maybe getting started homeschooling or thinking about getting started homeschooling on stories of people who have actually done that and are still doing it. And so to hopefully encourage you to let you know that this is something you can do if you have a child who struggles, that you can still homeschool. And it can be a very rewarding and wonderful experience. And my name is Peggy Ployer, and I'm the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool. And with me today is Amy Vickery, and Amy Vickery is on the Sped Homeschool team. And I'm excited to interview her because she is a wealth of information and an awesome homeschool mom. And so thanks for joining us, Amy, and just sharing your story and some of the wisdom that you've gained as you have started homeschooling. Thank you for having me here today. Yeah. So we're just going to talk about kind of the getting started. But as we do that, why don't you introduce us to your family and um, who you are, who your kids are, and, and what led you to homeschooling over any other type of educational choice? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm actually a single parent. Um, I homeschool um, two boys now. I have a nine-year-old that has autism that I've been homeschooling since kindergarten, and I have a four-year-old, which we're, while we're not doing a lot of formal things uh -huh. in this, this year, but he needed some things too. So yes. we're basically working on letters, identification, and he is starting to work through some math, though, because he is he understands those math concepts so naturally. That's really cool. It, yeah, you just kind of let, it seems like those younger ones, they just come along and a lot of people get really worried. Well, I've got younger kids. What do I do? And and I had the same experience as Amy had is like, give me my books. I want to learn. I want to do the same things you're doing with my older sibling. <laughs> so so that's encouragement. And, and you know, it's, um, it's really difficult to, to homeschool as a single parent, but I think a lot of parents now, especially with COVID, um, are finding themselves in having to make that decision of how do I balance all of this? And so I'm sure you're going to be talking about that more, but I just want to encourage you if, if that's um, something that is part of your situation in diving into homeschooling, that Amy has a lot of encouragement for you. And, um, and so, um, so yeah, to, to kind of get us started, um, what led to that that decision? We are going to to homeschool versus let's maybe not try this and let's let's stick with the the traditional school uh, approach instead of um, diving into the unknown. <laughs> so it started out as um, you know I had already always wanted to homeschool my mm -hmm. younger was homeschooled through middle school and high school because of struggles and difficulties that she had through elementary school. And yeah. as a result of that, she, um, my, my parents decided to homeschool her and I saw the experience that she had. We also had friends of the family and friends that they connected with that homeschooled. And I always really liked the idea of homeschooling. So it was always mm -hmm. kind of in the back of my mind anyways. Right. Uh, in college, I majored in education and I became a teacher and I started teaching um, and taught many years in the early childhood classroom and then moving into special education. Mm. And so I got that education background. Yeah. And so when my youngest got to be school age, I was actually for pre-K. We put him in school and I let him know, okay. This is where he's at. He knew all of his letters. He knew all of his sounds, but he mm -hmm. was struggling with rhyming. He was struggling with those um, auto, those tasks that are necessary for pre-reading, mm -hmm. but he was also ready to start learning sight words. And so I asked him, I said, will you please start working with him on sight words and just huh. kind of continue moving him forward? Right. They never did it. They never oh. did it. They behaviors were constantly an issue they were calling me every day right saying, this happened or that happened and he was coming home and just melting down and just mm. having a real time and so by the time we got to the end of the year I was like what are we doing I was like mm. I have the education to teach him um the, his dad at the time was not really on board with the idea of homeschooling 
I tell myself, mm-hmm. like, I have the education to do this. I have probably more education, more experience. Most of these teachers in the school. Right. Let me just try. And mm-hmm. so he finally agreed, let me try for the summer, at which point I joined with a lifetime membership to THSC. <laughs> which is the Texas Homeschool Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> So that was my first step to the trial for the summer and I started looking at curriculum and looking at things. And he just started making so much growth just with that one-on-one work and being able to work his pace. And, you know, through the next year, we, we, we finally had him diagnosed with autism. We had him um, Mm. found out he was basically blind in one eye. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. He still had not chosen hand dominant, so that that it actually at nine years old he still does not have a di- dominant hand. He does mm. do occupational therapy, and the therapist has said he's ambidextrous wow. because every she does, he is almost absolutely equal in <laughs> both hands. Wow! It's, he is he's truly ambidextrous, <laughs> but and. I've just let him take the lead on what hand he uses for what. It's mm-hmm. actually common in my family hmm. for I've left-handed and ambidextrous on both sides, my side and wow. his dad's side. So it's been quite a journey of figuring out exactly how to help him. Right. But you had the time also to be flexible and to learn your child so that you can give him the best education. We're in a classroom setting. It, that just isn't possible. And like, you know, even the requests you made of the teacher, they were not unreasonable requests. But when teaching 20 to 30 students, it can become a very unreasonable request just to have something different for one child. So, yeah. yeah. So as you dove into homeschooling, um, I'm sure a lot of people gave you advice. <laughs> What do you consider as the best advice you got when you first started? To give myself grace. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> and that was given to me by you. Oh. <laughs> Before I joined the Fed Homeschool team, I was having a really hard time um, because we had just found out that he was blind in one eye, basically, and yeah. started our of trying to correct his vision and I was like how could I have missed this and I was just mm. really upset and you you came alongside me and said you know what you have to just give yourself grace and you know you you have the answer now and you are starting to work on it now and that's okay right. and that's something I've carried with me over the last few years of dealing with us dilating his good eye so that we can mm. bring that left eye back and everything that we've done and now he basically has pretty even vision with his glasses in both eyes and awesome. it's, it's maintaining. Um, and his eyes are strengthening he's able to um, flow across text easily easier where he's starting to pick up and enjoy mm-hmm. reading chapters and things like that and so he's making really good progress yeah we, we can beat ourselves up as parents for not seeing those things that seem so obvious and um yeah, I, it, it's just a reminder that we all need. I mean, I, I gave that advice, but I need it back, you know, <laughs> because there are days, too, that I can beat myself up. And um, I can give good advice, but I got to take it, too, <laughs> and, and apply it. So um, that's definitely good to share all around. Um, so what was your biggest challenge that, you've, that you or your child or your family faced in starting the homeschooling journey? And, and how did you overcome that? I think my biggest challenge starting out was doing too much. Mm. I had a lot to prove coming from the world of education and having yeah. to prove that I could do it to his father and to his father's family who have a lot of educational background. Mm. And they just, they, they did not believe in homeschooling. And so I felt like I had a lot to prove starting out. And so I think that I tried to do more starting out than now, you know, looking back, I'm like, well, there probably some were some things I probably could have just not focused on or, or Mm -hmm. done less of, and we still would have been okay. Yeah. But, you know, 
And, and as I went through that first year, there were some things that I kind of cut back on because it was just too much. And mm. I, you know, over the years, um, you know, we've been homeschooling. This is our fourth year now. And I've turned more of the learning process over to him, to my oldest, in ways that allow him to take the lead and learn at his own pace in reading yeah. and and. Um, learning science and social studies and things like that. I put materials mm. in around the house and in place where that he can explore on his own. And he right. really enjoys that. He really enjoys being able to pick up books and read books of interest on his own. Mm. And I mm-hmm. think the biggest blessing I gave him was the, was the fact that I worked really hard with him those first two years on really getting him reading. Mm. And that was primary, our primary focus, that and math. Right. Just those, I, those two core things that open up so many opportunities for learning that your child can, like you said, you just give them the environment. That's correct. And kids want to learn. That's an important thing to know. Well, and at first, I was really concerned about the writing. And then as we were going through this vision process and the hand dominant issues and realizing mm-hmm. that you know, he hadn't picked a dominant hand, but, you know, he was relying completely on that right eye and then the left eye. And, and so going through all of that, I finally just backed off on the writing mm-hmm. and that was probably the best thing I could have done because yeah. now I see him proceeding through the writing process hmm. and this kind of our year that we're focusing on writing and I'm just uh-huh. not worried uh-huh. about you know, because the reading is taking off. He's reading on his own. I was thinking I probably should make a list and just put it in his thing of all the books he's read this year because he's read mm-hmm. probably over 50 beginner chapter books or chapter books because I've been wow. buying him books and he just devours them. Yeah. And so, okay, we're not, reading is not a problem. He understands and comprehends, tells me all about it. Hmm. And so... By being able to now, you know, reading is taken care of, you know, mm-hmm. we can come back and that later on for more formal ways and talk about those things that he would need for, um, for testing for, you know, when he gets to high school of, you know, being able to do standardized testing. We can address that down the road. I'm not worried. Right now he can just assimilate all he wants to and mm-hmm. gather all that information he wants to read. But now this year we're kind of working a little bit more on writing because mm-hmm. he can get those ideas out, but writing it down is such a chore. And so mm-hmm. working on those, those, those muscles that yeah. go into writing along mm-hmm. with the writing process. And sometimes it's a learning process about learning to summarize. Mm-hmm. And yeah. 30 sentences, six, because six is too many for him to write. He literally gets fatigued and exhausted from it. Right. So getting him to put it down into three sentences rather than, you know, the six sentences he really wants to write, it, mm-hmm. it, you know, that's a challenge. And that's, it's a good process for him to go through to learn how to express himself more um, succinctly and more clearly. And that's a skill in our day and age that is so much needed because sound bites and little bits of information have to express so much because people's attention spans are so short. So, um, but and I love that you point out, you know, that there's, there's certain things that he's, he's progressing at and you kind of allowed things naturally as he was, was able and willing that, you would you would then work on those things, but didn't feel like across the board he had to be you know at the same level in math and writing because a lot of our kids that struggle do they have those those um, peaks and valleys of learning and we have to be able to ebb and flow with them as our kids do. And my well, kids were the one same of the things way. That to me was when he or drew everything was scribbled. Well, that's probably all he was seeing. Mm, and so this year his drawing has taken on a whole nother level where his drawing actually has meaning and form and you can actually look at it and tell, oh, mm-hmm. it's you know, a dragon or it's a tree or mm-hmm. whereas, you know, and that's, you know, most kids reach that stage at about four to five and here right. he's not 
just reaching that stage, but it's because of all the challenges he had to overcome to get mm-hmm. to that stage. Right. And so, but that stage happened before a child can sit down and start writing work. Yeah. Yes. There are, there are certain steps and if you, you can't skip over them. I know um, there's a, a blog, definitely on our website that talks about that too. I, I think, um, one of our team members a while ago wrote on different stages of writing and all of those different things. So definitely if you have a child that's struggling to write, um, just do a search on our website at spedhomeschool.com for that. Um, so there is a lot of homeschooling misconceptions. Um, and I'm sure you had to put aside some in teaching your student. What advice do you have for parents who may be struggling with um, just these preconceived notions that they're bringing in to homeschooling, maybe not even realizing that they're bad things to, to bring in with them. And, and how do you just overcome the ones that you have? So when I talk to um, families that are looking to homeschool, some of the things that I tell them is to, one, remember that it's not going to look like public school. It's not going to yeah. take as long. Working with a child one-on-one or with, you know, just even two or three child, ch- child, listen to me, children, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, the instruction is so much more intense. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, they're going to be taking things in a lot faster, but it's also more tiring on them because when you're in a classroom and you're sitting in a group of 20 kids, Things are repeated more than once. So you can kind of mentally check out and check back in and not miss a whole lot. Right. That's a good point. And Mm -hmm. And so when you're working one on one or just, you know, even with two or three kids, you know, they have to be on the Mm. whole time. Right. And it's tiring. And so after about 10, 15 minutes, they're probably going to need a break. Yeah. You know, especially Mm -hmm. if you're doing things that are back and forth. And so it's okay for it to just take five minutes or 10 minutes or even 15 minutes right. for you to get through a topic or a subject. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to do your whole school day and realize that you're done in one hour or two hours and you are expecting it to take five or six. Mm-hmm. You know, don't add more in because you need to be able to celebrate for yourself and for your child that you worked really hard. Right. Yeah. And that work probably would have taken that longer amount of time in a classroom. Mm-hmm. But it, there's nothing wrong with finishing it faster. Yes, that's, yeah. And we, we've heard from so many parents recently, especially, you know, with COVID and so many people just trying to move the, the classroom and even the virtual schooling into their, their homes, that they're trying to replicate the entire school schedule into their homes. And, and for that reason... That's why you don't do an hour <laughs> of a class or even 45 minutes um, because, yeah, that, that, that's a great explanation. It's the best I've heard from anybody on, on why that needs that 10, 15 minutes, five minutes, even for younger kids is more than enough. They, they get that, um, the instruction that they need. So, um, so Amy, you have a lot of really great ideas. Um, you've written a lot of wonderful blogs on our website, um, just about scheduling, organization strategies, teaching techniques. Um, can you just share some of your favorites? So some people like a timer, but what I found early on with my oldest was if I set a timer, he watched the timer. He didn't oh. do <laughs> it can be distracting. But what yes. I found- <laughs> He thought it was great. He loved to watch the little bit. I was uh, like, <laughs> time, time was not effective for him. Mm. So I found a very simple checklist worked really well. And mm-hmm. something interesting that I found was if they were right-handed, putting the check marks on the right-hand side. And since my son was left-handed, it worked better to put the check marks on the left-hand side. Yes. So that you could see what you're checking off. Mm-hmm. That way they're not having to cross the page to do the checking. Yeah. So that was just, that was something I found with, especially with younger kids, is making sure that whatever hand dominance they have, 
that's where you put your check box, your check boxes. Yeah. Um, I really like the checklist. Now it's, um, you know, our checklist has kind of evolved in that I hand him instead of have, you know, having a checklist and handing him one thing at a time, I can actually hand him his stack, uh, show him his stack of whatever it is he's doing for the day. Mm-hmm. And I let him know, okay, that must be thing, then you're done. Right. And so, so, and so now our checklist has evolved from a list and one item at a time to here's your work for the day. Mm-hmm. Physically <clears throat> when you're, you're done. Yeah. And that has, he's pretty independent on it now. You know, every, I know that's a big question that parents ask is how do I get my yes. kid to be independent? Um, <laughs> the first step is you work at their independent level mm-hmm. and know that if it's something that's not that something they can do independently, you're going to have to be there right. excuse me, to help answer questions. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, we, we would just start out with, okay, he, I would say, tell him, okay, answer this question. And he would answer the question. I'd immediately give him a sticker or a stamp or something. Hmm. And then, you know, I would, I would say, okay, answer the next one. And I would walk away. And then come back. And if he had answered it, he immediately got a sticker or a stamp. And I would kind of watch to see when he, when he would do it. Right. And if he didn't do it with like a short amount of time, I would come back and, you know, pro- tell him again, okay, um, answer the question. And as soon as he did it, I would, you know, give him a sticker or a stamp and we would go through this and then I would kind of stretch it out over two or three problems. Mm. And then Mm -hmm. eventually we got to the point after a few days of doing this where he wanted to do the sticker or the stamp himself when he answered it. Ah, uh huh. And so then then I let him take over, you know, doing his own reward. And now we can get Mm. through a whole page of stuff without, you know, unless he gets on something and then you know, and right. I, I just kind of make myself available mm-hmm. but as long as he does that he can pretty much do a whole page of stuff completely by himself with just maybe a few you know one or two reminders to you know hey make sure you're getting done right you know mm-hmm. and so and so I find that if you're working on their level mm-hmm. and you know you start out working with them and you, eventually you can wean them off of that and, and get them working independently yeah. That's good advice because, yeah, we, it's, you, I, I think the, the way you, you approached it is so good that, you know, you, you, you kind of start with not assuming any type of independence and then slowly kind of pull back and, and keep checking in because they, once they get stuck, I mean, I, a lot of parents will say, you know, I'll turn around and where did they go? <laughs> because <laughs> we, we want them to be so yeah. independent so quickly. Um, and that's just, it's, it's a progression. It's not something that all of a sudden happens just overnight. <laughs> and we have our days where the great Houdini appears and he is <laughs> not there anymore. <laughs> I, I still have that with my 16 year old you know if I walk away from math for too long I'm like okay I'm gonna go take a couple things out of the dishwasher on just the other side of the island um, but know that you can ask the question while you're working on this because otherwise you know she'll just get frustrated and say oh whenever you come back I'll I'll come back too well that isn't the goal <laughs> so yeah communication right. it doesn't matter how old your kid is you know, th- this is something they all struggle with because mm-hmm. you know they they, they get struggle, they get frustrated, they and they they shut down, and yeah. so you know, knowing how to to regain that independence and teach them how to ask for help when they need it is so mm-hmm. important. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. That's that's awesome, and um, and I know you have a uh, that that checklist with the the left hand check. Marks. If you look under left hand on the Sped Homeschool website, you'll actually see a picture of Amy's checklist. So um, you can find that there and just the kind of the, the process. I remember it was an aha moment for you when you wrote that. <laughs> so, uh, But we all have aha moments as parents as we're homeschooling. And um, as a trained teacher, um, do you find that you're having just as many aha moments as every other homeschool parent? <laughs> if not more. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are some things that you do have to kind of overcome because, again, making sure it doesn't look like public school. Mm-hmm. Um, giving yourself permission to change. You know, yes. if something's not working, don't continue to do it. 
Mm, you know, mm-hmm. can, what can you change about what you're doing? What can you change about, you know, how you're doing it? Do you need to just type the curriculum and put it on the shelf for a while and come back to it right. later? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's all those things. And so, you know, I think as te- you know, as a teacher, that was a little bit harder to accept in some mm-hmm. ways because obviously I've been teaching a while. I should be able to do this. Right. But when it comes to your, te- your own child, sometimes, you know, the rules don't work the same way. <laughs> 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 you have to just kind of stop and rethink. And so, mm-hmm. I, you know, my first year I found what it was supposed to be a, a reading and spelling curriculum. I was going to use it for spelling. And I thought it was great and it because it was short and sweet. And mm-hmm. I thought, well, this is great. And so I was going through it with him and it was just hmm. pulling teeth and I was like okay this should not be this hard yeah so I put it away mm-hmm. and I revisited it once or twice and then I was like nope it's still not working for him because phonics didn't work for him basically mm-hmm. and so it was not for him that was going to work and so it's gotten put away so I probably now that he's actually gone back and taught himself phonics now that he's reading, I thought we should pull that program back out and see how it works for him. Mm -hmm. Because I bet Mm -hmm. we would have a success story now. Right. Yeah. Well, it goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning was that, you know, there's, there's a certain time and place for everything and that his pace and what he was ready um, to learn just wasn't right there there at that moment. But um, we tend to blame the curriculum when the curriculum maker makes curriculum for an average child or a a certain child that they have, you know, a standard. Um, And there's only so much give and take that a curriculum has. And I know Dawn talked about this in her interview too, was just that we have to adapt, we have to change. And just like Amy was talking about, you know, and that that requires sometimes putting things away and taking them back out later. (laughs) So, so that's great advice. So, um, Amy, in addition to homeschooling two kids and being a single parent, you have uh, a business as well as you're going to school. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that as we wrap up? <laughs> so I was um, blessed by God moving mountains and opening doors about a year and a half ago to into a uh, master's program to become an educational diagnostician. And so I have um, one semester left, and so this summer I will be um, able to start testing um, homeschoolers for awesome. um, learning disabilities and dyslexia and things like that. And so I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm doing this through my business right now. Um, I do private tutoring and um, I've done classes in, in the past. I don't have any classes going on right now, but I'm, I am doing private tutoring and working with um, homeschoolers, um, not just in the United States. I actually have a student in Puerto Rico, too. So, wow. um, <laughs> But I have students all over the United States. And um, the, when I do start doing testing, that will be in the greater um, I-35 corridor, South corridor, San Antonio type area. Um, just because that is something that I, I've done the research on it, and I just don't know at this point in time that it's going to be something that's going to be um, easy to implement online. I know some people are, mm-hmm. and I just um, I'm not finding a way to do it, do do it to the quality that I would want to do it. Yeah, and most most special needs testing. It's a good thing to point out to parents that that testing in person is much higher quality than if you would do it online. So that's um, definitely good. So um, hopefully soon, Amy will have her her tutoring and consulting stuff on our website um, at spedhomeschool.com. But if you are looking for someone as a consultant to come alongside you to kind of help you set up your curriculum, we have tons of consultants that um, work with our community, as well as tutors, people that do testing, um, educational testing, as well as um, special needs testing. And um, 
and also just therapy providers as well. So, um, so check out our website definitely for those resources. So Amy, I just want to thank you for all of your insight and for sharing from your experience. Um, I'm sure it's going to be an encouragement to many. Um, it was just encouraging for me to listen. <laughs> so, so thanks for your time. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you, Peggy, for having me. Yeah. All right. And um, definitely check out our website. It's bedhomeschool.com for, for more encouragement and resources. Bye, everyone. <laughs>